Good morning, everyone. Glad to be with you today, and we're going to continue our series in the book of Psalms as we make our way through the entire Old Testament. And today, we're going to be in Psalm 119. Last week, we were in Psalm 118, but today in Psalm 119. And you already know about this psalm and many of its elements, and we'll get into that in just a moment. So get your Bibles and uh, join me as I pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that we're able to come together over your word today. And I pray, Lord, that you'll give us insight, application for living, and real assurance that what you say to us is true and wonderful and believable and will make a difference in our lives and the lives of others. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, Psalm 119, of course, is the longest chapter in the Bible. It's the longest psalm in the Bible. And if you'll remember, probably from your studies, uh, each uh, sort of pericope or each one of these sections begins with a letter in the Hebrew alphabet. So it starts with Aleph, De and Aleph, and all that goes on, Zion, you know, and whatever, um, all the way over. And so uh, these words begin the psalm. And it's, it's some of the most creative writing ever uh, in terms of poetry and lyrics and whatever. So uh, as we look at this today, we want to see what the Word of God is and what it does, and how the psalmist viewed the, viewed the Word of God, and what he said about it, uh, that it would be, you know, really good for us. One of the, one of the verses in here that I've, and you need to keep your, Bible, keep your Bibles open. We'll be jumping all around today. And uh, in Psalm 119, 89, we find out something that's really good. He says, Forever your word is settled in the heavens, O Lord. Your faithfulness continues throughout all generations and you establish your, uh, the earth, and it stands. He's talking about creation, how God spoke, and the Word of God is enduring. It doesn't change. We might say it crudely, something like this. When God speaks something, it stays spoken. So God said, let there be light. There's still light, and there's going to be light for as long as we live. So we understand that the Bible, first of all, is true. All of its parts are true. And, you know, we need to take the Bible as a whole. There are critics of Scripture who dive into Scripture and say, well, this little fact or this is wrong and whatever. And by the way, they've never been proven to be wrong. And some of the inconsistencies that you see and whatever amount to really nothing whatsoever. The Bible needs to be taken as a whole, and it needs to be taken for its subject matter. Its subject matter begins with God who creates a world and individuals on that world, mankind, on purpose and with a purpose to give him glory and to enjoy his favor and fellowship forever so we can know him and be known by him and to live eternally with him. And then the Bible goes on to explain that in man's rebellion and sin, he has restored us in Jesus Christ. That comes over a long period of time as the word of God is established. And, and as we see in the word of God, he continually by his word and by his deeds and actions reveals himself and reveals his purposes to us and they're always and ever more true and he's faithful never to change his truth. I think that's very important. And so when the psalmist says, your word is unchanging, we can't take the word of God and then begin to say, well, when it's inspiring, it's inspiring. And if I read it and it doesn't inspire me, then, you know, then it's not inspiring. We can't say that. The Bible claims for itself that it's God-breathed. It's inspired by God. It's a living word. It's a word that, that speaks to every generation, any person in every generation. The Bible is the only book written for every individual in the world. And it doesn't matter if you're just barely literate or if you're hearing the word of God spoken to you or what. That word is alive and it brings life to us. Why? Because it's true. And it's unchanging. And so we can't change the Word of God when we say it does inspire. We can't change the Word of God by saying, oh, well, that was then, this is now. No, when God speaks, He speaks completely. Now, in the Old Testament, sometimes He spoke. And in the New Testament, that's revealed or that's revealed in a greater way. And so the two obviously come together because they're really the same thing. One is sort of the beginning of that revelation and the end of that revelation, the fullness of that revelation, we find in Jesus Christ and the word of the New Testament in Jesus Christ. But the Bible also says a number of things about itself and the psalmist recognizes this. 
he uses various words here. He uses the he says the word of God, the law of God, the precepts of God, the testimonies of the Lord. Uh, you know, all all of these things he he talks about the commandments of the Lord over and over again. He uses these words to represent all of the word of God. In Psalm 10, uh, 119, 107, it says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path. And he said, I have sworn and will confirm it that I will keep your ordinances. And this is important. So what is he saying? The word of God is a guide for us in life. I don't know and you don't know all the truth we need to know. I don't know all the truth I need to know and the truth I know May not, be, may not be available to me in my mind as the wisdom I need to make decisions uh, today or to understand the world that I'm in. But the Word of God is such that when we go to it, it guides us. Listen to this. The Word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Do you need direction in your life today? Yes. God doesn't tell us 20 days in the future what our life's going to be or 200 years in the future or 1,000 years. And I don't need to know that because it's not here. It's not real today. What is real is what I need to, uh, today. And I can go to the Word of God and I can receive from God the guidance that I need. Uh, the guidance that I need, the guidance that I, 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 uh, I require is something that's so very incredible and important to me. And so I, I think we need to understand that. When we go to the living Word of God, Jesus Christ is the ultimate reflection of that. We understand that. But when I go to any part of the living Word of God and I'm praying and the Holy Spirit begins to interpret that for me, He doesn't interpret it just for my head. He interprets it for my life and my decisions. It's amazing how you can read the Word of God and you can be over in Jeremiah somewhere and God will give you insight for your marriage. You can be in Revelation somewhere and God will give you insight to your vocation. You can be in John 3.16 somewhere, a longtime believer, and God can speak to you about the mercy and the goodness of God for your day that you need in that moment. It's just amazing because it's a living Word of God, and it always has the power to guide us. I know that every day in my life, I can say what, like we saw last week in Psalm 118, this is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. But my rejoicing also needs to, be, uh, need to be tempered or added to with wisdom and discernment and understanding and confidence and real truth for my situation. You're going to live today and tomorrow and the following days. You're going to live with challenges uh, to your faith and challenges to your experience and challenges to your understanding. And you're going to say to yourself many, many times in your life, I'm not sure of what I need to do. This is exactly why we need to go to the Word of God with the prayerful intent of hearing from God. Not just reading the words and being inspired by them, but going to the Word of God and saying, God, speak to me. And He absolutely will. If you seek Him through His Word, He's going to speak to you. And when you say, I don't know what to do, you probably end up saying, I'm not sure this is the right thing, but this is what I feel led to do, or this is what God has shown me to do. And you know, sometimes when we make these decisions and God gives us these things in our lives, uh, they're, they're not always pleasant. Decisions we make in our lives don't always make people happy. It doesn't always make us happy. Decisions we make in our lives are, are that way. I remember, can I just give you an illustration of this? I remember years ago, I was in a relationship with a young lady who was, who was fine. And, and as far as I knew, even today, she's fine. But God spoke to my heart during that time and just let me know when I didn't know what to do and there was a stirring in my life that our relationship should not continue. And it, it wasn't a very pleasant thing. I, I didn't like that particularly. And when we discussed that, uh, it didn't make either one of us feel uh, better, and yet it was the right thing to do. So my feeling was overshadowed by the truth of God's Word, not only for myself, but for the young lady. And it's proven out in our lives, uh, both of our lives, many, many times over. So sometimes the Word of God guides us, and it, it shows us and illuminates for us what we need to do 
and it's not always uh, pleasant or it's not always what we would accept or what we would want, and yet it's absolutely the right thing to do. And I remember what James said in the book of James. He said, for the one, the man who knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, it's sin. And so we want to be away from that. We don't want to uh, uh, go through that. But notice, I want to jump back now to Psalm 119 and verse 9 as we talk about sin. How can a young man keep his way pure by keeping it according to the word? Young man, old man, young woman, old woman, it doesn't matter. How can you keep yourself pure? How can you keep your way pure? It doesn't just mean holy and without sin. It means the right way. How can you expect to live in the right way? Well, if the Bible is a, is, is, is a lamp unto our feet, you know, a light to our path and a lamp unto our feet to guide us in the way, to live the right way in my life, I need, I must cling to the Word of God. By knowing the Word of God and the ordinance of God, the testimonies of God, the commands of God, the laws of God, the ways of God, then my life can be led in a pure way, in a good way, in a way that pleases the Lord, gives glory to Him and honor to Him, in a way that doesn't hurt anybody else, no matter what they think of me, in a way that allows me to live with confidence and assurance and not stumble along the way. When I've stumbled in my life, I've gone contrary and counter to the Word of God, which means I've gone contrary and counter to the will of God. I think many of us, I'm guilty of this from time to time, try to establish the will of God in our minds from what we know and understand without ever contacting or going to the Word of God. You know, we don't connect to the Word of God, and so our way is, you know, kind of muddled and whatever. Listen, when you, when you live in God's Word and you live in the will of God, and then you know the way of God, then you're going to live a life that's going to have balance. It's going to have order in this crazy and uh, upsetting world. And it doesn't mean every day is going to be ordered like you just check things off on a list. It means that in the surprises of any day or the ups and downs of any week, you're going to be able to maintain composure and a steadiness because you're living in the power of God by the Word of God. And I like this. He says in verse 11 of Psalm 119, Your word have I treasured, have I hidden in my heart, that I might not sin against you. Now, what happens when we sin? When we sin, then we begin to uh, lose all the benefits of our salvation. Think, think about it for just a minute. You know, my sins and yours are paid for in Jesus Christ. And when we come to faith in Christ, Past, present, and future, the blood of Jesus Christ continually cleanses us from our sins. But if we're not careful, we take that for granted. And when you sin, you separate yourself from the presence of the Lord and the will of God and the benefits of the Lord. So he says, I've treasured, uh, I dug a hole and put all the benefits in, the, in my heart, a hole in my heart, and I've put them right there so I wouldn't sin against you. I don't want to lose the benefits of my salvation which would be what? First of all, just the kind of pure living that I just talked about, where I have a real focus of what's going on in my life. I have a real peace about what's going on in my life. I understand the presence of the Holy Spirit in my life. No matter what I'm feeling, I understand that that's to be true. I have the assurance of God's word and God's will and God's presence in my life. And not only that, I have his wisdom and discernment, and it's there ready. The Bible says if we lack wisdom, we ask God for it. That's in the Word of God. If we treasure that Word in my heart, then when I come to a daily decision or I come to a monumental decision in my life, I know God's going to give me wisdom, the right thing to do, and discernment how to make that decision work in my life and when I should, in fact, decide. I think that's very important for us to know that when we sin, I want to say this again, when we sin, we lose the benefits of our salvation. And so that's why it's important for us to come back, as the Word of God says, to confess our sins, agree with God, to reject those sins, turn away from those sins, so that we can be cleansed of the Lord and we can live in a pure way again, letting the Word of God be a, 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 a light to us and a lamp to us, 
a beacon, if you will, to eliminate our, to illuminate, not eliminate, to illuminate our way so that we can walk in the right kind of way. It keeps us from sin. It gives us purity. It gives us the right kind of life. Have you ever thought about what the purpose of your life is? It's very easy. To live in such a way that we please God who saved us, right? That we help our fellow man by serving them. That we love the brothers and sisters in the local church and the church universal and support them. We give our lives in love to this world like God so loved the world. We do the same thing. And we allow God to work through our lives to accomplish his purpose in us, for us, around us, and through us uh, that people might know of the hope that is within us. And when that's true, it doesn't matter what our vocation is. It doesn't matter if you're a preacher or a plumber, does it? It doesn't matter if you're a, if you're a teacher or just uh, uh, or, or anything else. I said just anything else. Everything becomes important because every task we do, as we do it unto the Lord with those uh, purposes in mind, becomes sacred. Our work, our daily work and lives become sacred. Not, out, not, not, not no matter how mundane it is. So if I'm washing clothes at home, I'm benefiting myself and others who are going to have clean clothes. That's an act of God's grace and mercy. If I'm writing a letter or an article, if I'm doing something with my hands, if I'm preparing food at a restaurant, whatever I do is I do it to the Lord, I realize from God's word that that's a pure way of life. Nearly everything we do by means of work, unless it's illegal, benefits somebody else. That's God's will and God's way. That's God's purpose for work. So that we can do our best so we can serve the needs and the interests of others and make them at their best. One of the interesting things that I found in this particular book, uh, this particular psalm, I should say, is how many times the psalmist talks about being revived by the Word of God. I usually don't do this, but I've written down a little laundry list here. And I want In verses 25, 37, 40, 50, 107, 88, 144, 154, 156, and 159, the psalmist says, revive me according to your word. So let's look in verse 25 uh, just a minute. He says, my soul cleaves to the dust. Revive me according to my word. You know, life is like that sometimes. Sometimes we get so weary. It may be through a disease. It may be through a condition in our family. It may be through a condition at our work. Or it may be just the overburden that we have thinking about our world and all the shootings and the mess, you know, all the abortions and all this kind of stuff going on. And, and we just, we, our soul it says, is just lower uh, than low can be. We're, we're just, we're clinging to the dust. And what does he say? He says, revive me according to your word. I love what the next verse says. I've told you of my ways and you answered me. Now teach me your statutes. Make me understand your precepts. I'm going to meditate on your wonders and my soul weeps because of grief. So strengthen me according to your word. Remove the false way from me. You know what he's saying, Lord? I'm down here in my soul. I, I'm, you know, on my last spiritual breath. And I'm turning my attention not to my condition, but I'm turning my attention in your word to the truth of who you are and who you are in my relationship with you. That's a wonderful thing. That's how you get revived. You can't get revived by going on vacation. Do you know that? If your soul is down, when you get back off vacation, you got all this stuff to face you, right? You can't get revived by just getting away for a day and you know going out for dinner and whatever. That might help temporarily, but it didn't do anything to change the condition, did it? The only way we can truly be revived as believers is to go into the presence of the Lord. And that's by going into the presence of the Lord by reading and knowing his word and reflecting upon his word and meditating upon his word and calling out his name and calling out in prayer based upon his word and what we know to be is the truth. And when we do, there's reviving coming. I like that. I really do. Because sometimes I just don't want to put one foot in front of the other foot. I don't feel like I can come up with another sermon or another answer. I don't feel like I can watch another newscast or read anything else on social media. It's taken all of my soul away from me. The Bible says, I understand. Go to the Word of God and be revived. Notice what it says in verse 37. It says, 
Turn away uh, my eyes from uh, looking at, at vanity and revive me in your ways. You know, he's saying, Lord, I look at a lot of things that are absolutely useless and I don't need them. So revive me in your ways. I don't want to know my way. I want to know the Lord's way. I, I, want, I want the Lord to say, here's the way, walk in it. That's how you get revived, by God showing you the way to go. I won't read all these verses, but in verse 40, he says, Revive me according to the right your righteousness. Show me again what I've received in Christ, and I'll be revived. Then he says, Revive me in my trouble, in Psalm, in verse 107. He says, Revive me in my trouble. Listen to this. I'm exceedingly afflicted. Revive me, O Lord, according to your word. When pressure comes, and trouble comes, and grief comes, and disappointment comes, what do we do? Well, we can look around and, you know, talk to people and whatever. Or we can go to the Word of God and cry out to say, God, I'm going to your Word. Revive me. Give me a new heart, a new life. Give me something. He said, revive me in Psalm uh, 11988. According to your mercy. Lord, I, I don't even know what to say, but be merciful to me right now. And then, of course, in Psalm 119 and 170, one of the great verses in this great psalm, he says, let my prayer come before you. Deliver me according to your word. Deliver me according to your word, according to your promise. That's one of the great things. We can go to the word of God and claim the promises of God. And so whatever we're faced with, confusion, chaos, uncertainty, don't know the way to go, can't make that decision. He says, deliver me from all of this according to your word. Are you having trouble today making up your mind? Are you having trouble today about a fear of the future? Having trouble today with anything in your life and you say, I, I just wish I knew what to do? Go to the word of God. You say, well, where should I go? Go wherever God leads you. I don't say that you should just go to the word of God and pick and choose, but you can. Go to the psalm. The psalmist takes all of this. Go to the words of Christ. Go to the gospel of John. Now go anywhere you need to go. Go to the epistles. Go to Genesis and read the Word of God and say, God, I need reviving. I need a, a light on my path, a lamp to my feet. God, I need a pure way of living. I want to go to this Word, and I'm praying in all humility that you'll touch my life and my heart as I go to this Word. And God, I believe you will revive me and show me the way I should walk in it. God, Change me emotionally. Change my mind. Change my life. Isn't it good to know we have the Word of God? Isn't it good to love the Word of God and feast upon the Word of God? Because it's always living. It stays secure so that we can be steady and upright. Man, what a great thing it is for us. What a great gift this Bible is to you and me. Heavenly Father, thank you that in the Word of God we have all that we need. You've given us insight, understanding, a living breath to our lives. Fulfilled in Jesus Christ, we see things and gain strength like we never could before. So I pray for all who listen and see this broadcast. I pray, Heavenly Father, that we are revived according to give strength and life and a fresh wind of revival to all of us who need it today in these turbulent, troubled times. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. What a great day it's been. And I can't wait to be with you next week as we continue to move through these great psalms, great psalms that I love, and I hope you love them too. Until next week, God bless you and keep you in his will.